Hi, this is uh, the new VR seasonal flu package from the Hubnet and Voyager Medical. Um, today we're going to have a look at an immersive experience um, of flu. Obviously we'd love to get you down and get some more kind of hands-on practical experience but using the VR technology we hope to bridge that gap and hope to bring you more of a kind of interactive and more absorbed feel uh, to the training itself. So you can watch this in regular kind of 2D format uh, on YouTube, quite simple. However, to get the most of the experience, we recommend getting one of these or a normal VR headset. This is called Google Cardboard. You can buy it from the Hubnet and we'll deliver it straight to you. But essentially, it's a VR headset with some lenses in it. What you do when you get it is you get the video that you're watching now, put it onto a smartphone and then place it inside of the device and then close it like so. So essentially you've got a screen with some glasses on the front. And what you do is you select using this button up at the top right and then put it on your face and then start by pressing the button on the top. This is very much in a experimental mode at the moment. Um, but we hope you enjoy this new experience. We're also gonna do some um, in-house work here at Douglas Pharmacy. The whole idea of doing this training in VR is to give you a kind of more immersive experience of training. Just watching videos is good, but we find that people learn better if they're in the actual environment that they're practicing. So in a moment we'll see um, me doing a consultation within the actual pharmacy itself. So this is me in the consultation room, um, waiting for a patient to come in to do um, a flu vaccination uh, with me. Uh, I've got the NHS Flu Vaccination Service patient questionnaire and obviously before I come into the room, making sure it looks clean and tidy, making sure it's appropriate for a patient to come in, that it's confidential, and also that I've got my anaphylaxis kit available. You can look at our anaphylaxis video, um, which tells you about what to do in uh, an anaphylaxis emergency. Um, if you're doing patients above the age of 18, the Resuscitation Council says that you should be administering 500 micrograms of adrenaline. You can do this in a number of ways. Uh, Auto-injector obviously is quite uh, useful um, because it's quite quick to grab onto, but also you can use vials. So one of the other things that I carry with me when I come into um, the consultation room is I've got a spot plaster which I find kind of useful because some patients bleed quite a lot. So I'm there holding uh, a bit of cotton wool um, with my left hand above and using a syringe to inject and then I hold this over the actual uh, place of administration and I tell the patient sometimes oh just hold that there for a moment and that will stop the bleed and wait for it to kind of coagulate and then I take off the spot plaster throw it in my clinical bin which is uh, behind you there and I have uh, a plaster this uh, just a spot plaster to cover it up if needed. The other two things I keep uh, handy are one mil syringes, okay? Uh, the majority of flu vaccinations are pre-filled, so uh, you don't really need to worry about this, but let's say you have an ampule of adrenaline. Uh, let's say your uh, auto-injector stops working, the emeraid or whatever you might have, and you need to administer quickly uh, an alternate um, adrenaline solution. So that hence the one mil, you fill it up to 0.5 mil of adrenaline, one in 1,000, and then there's a blue intramuscular needle. Um, I'll try kind of demonstrate this for the camera. My hands are clean, I've already washed them. You can wear gloves. Um, sometimes helps to kind of remind you that you're in a dispensary um, and you're moving into kind of clinical um, work. So um, you open up like so. Um, it's sterile, banana, the blue needle, put it on top, and there you go, that's ready for administration. I tend to leave it like uh, This would be pre-filled. Um, did you have a flu vaccination last winter? Yes, no. If yes, where were you vaccinated? How did you hear about this pharmacy flu service? This is really 
mean, these aren't really clinical questions. Um, these are more to do with the government trying to figure out if commissioning pharmacies is worthwhile. Um, in my opinion, my humble opinion, I think it is worthwhile. So um, the more data that they have via this patient questionnaire, um, the better. So make sure you fill that in and, and return it. Other than that, you need to ask the patient certain clinical questions, which we go over on the other videos that we have on the HubNet website. But once that's all through and you've got the consent, um, you sit the patient down. I tend to get the patient to be relaxed. And, I mean, it's quite difficult, but um, I tend to get their arms like so and make sure that this, um, the left or right, whichever you're administering into, is, is nice and relaxed. And you can tell that by kind of maybe picking it up or looking at the patient and seeing if they look nervous. Or I find kind of talking to them as well reduces anxiety quite a lot. Um, and then once that's done, uh, with this shirt, you probably wouldn't un, un, uh, unravel it, you probably unbutton it in the middle. Uh, I won't do a striptease, um, but you put it um, to the side and then you would sit appropriately next to the patient, put the hand on top and administer. Again, for those who are new, so the syringe uh, barrel will be like so, and then you put the hand on top and then administer like that. That immediately, after you've administered the vaccination, is classified as clinical hazardous waste, right? So what do you do with that? I've had the uh, issue of sometimes I realise that the label is still on there, but because that's um, hazardous, I throw it away immediately. Uh, you definitely have to remember uh, to take off the label beforehand and then stick it on your form. Uh, that's quite useful for provenance to see um, what the pharmacist actually giving out. I'm actually getting nervous <laughs> handling this um, because you never know. I find this is like a ticking time bomb, uh, that the longer this is exposed, the more risk I have of sticking it into myself or into the patient. So I'm gonna throw that away in my bin bar with me. You'll notice that the clinical waste bin is actually above, I'll take off the wall now, uh, clinical waste bin is actually hanging above uh, the patient on the wall. Um, some pharmacies I've come in to have a look at sometimes have this on the floor and the problem with that is if the patient's there this might get knocked over lots and lots of issues so I find these clinical waste bins although in surgeries these are quite popular but in pharmacies not so much then you can just hang it onto the wall like so uh, it's out of the way you don't need to worry about it um, and reduces needle sticks um, so I'm going to put that back up. Uh, some people ask with uh, the cotton wool, is that clinical waste? Would you throw that in, say, a waste paper basket? No, because uh, potentially you've got hazardous uh, substances on it, so throw that away. Um, these things, because they're not sharps or medicines as such, you can throw that in the bin. And then um, I tend to wait with the patient for a little bit, talk to them, make sure everything's fine, make sure their arm's fine, and then take them to the pharmacy uh, once everything's clear and um, either process them for payment or just finish off the, um, the risk assessment form. Okay, so we're at uh, Road Farm Pharmacy today uh, with uh, Jignesh Patel, uh, who's gonna pop in in a sec. We're gonna talk a little bit about his experience doing flu. I think he's done about 10 years worth um, my experience, I've done around about 10 years worth as well. So I think what we're going to do is just kind of have almost a, an informal chat really about um, best practice and things that we've seen in our time, which uh, you, you may be able to kind of learn uh, from and kind of how, how we've dealt with it. Um, this is his consultation room. It's pretty damn good, uh, pretty large. Uh, it's got a bed behind. As you can see, um, beds, they're not 100% uh, required, but very, very useful. But one thing to keep in mind is if a CPR and anaphylaxis does occur, you'd probably do it on the floor because it'd be kind of difficult to um, get on top of the patient and get the actual leverage. Um, cabinets are quite good, um, making sure that things are hidden, making sure that everything is uh, confidential so people can't come in and read labels. Um, about patient medicines and so forth. 
probably an anaphylaxis kit in here, um, which is kind of readily available. Uh, that's a spill spill kit there as well. So you've got a, a kidney dish uh, and some cotton buds as well. Cotton buds are useful for if the patient's bleeding. Um, a clinical waste bin, which is covered and kind of out of the way. Clean and tidy workstation, um, you know, looks professional. In the corner there, you've got um, a sink, which has got hot and cold water uh, with um, uh, hand instructions is quite good. It's not here yet, but I'm sure Jim is pretty good at washing his hands. Um, you've got uh, green paper towels, uh, which is quite useful. And I think there's a fridge in here as well, which is quite useful for kind of accessibility. And it means as well, um, often in my practice, that you don't get um, to go into the other, uh, you don't have to go into the dispensary to uh, get the vaccination itself. Firstly, it's kind of practice about the actual administration of the vaccination. Yeah. Um, so people get confused as to um, a great one is they put it in with two hands, yeah. or they put it in with one hand, and then um, and then they kind of move it around and then inject. How do you do it? Me? Yeah. I just pull the skin. Yeah. Again, jab. Yeah. So it, 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 my, my thumb's there, so you're going there. This is one solid, one, smooth action. Yeah, yeah. yeah. this is a good yeah. idea. Because uh, you know, if, if, if it's deep intermuscular, I just I spread the skin a bit and then put it in. Yeah. If it's uh, subcutaneous, you pinch the skin at an angle. Yeah. Push it in and put yeah. it out. It's pretty simple. Yeah. <laughs> but do you remember the first one that you did? Uh, I think I, I, I've been using the same techniques in the as you've done it first time around. <laughs> when I did, when I did the Novartis flu program, yeah. that was in uh, 2008. Yeah. Not change my technique much at all, but how how have what have you learned since the learned about knowing where the actual deltoid muscle is? Yep. That's the key, key thing. Is where so uh, you you know where, where to fill up this top part. You know to cover up. Yeah. So, so as soon as you've done that, you know where, where the, uh, the part of the muscle that you need to actually yeah. vaccinate in. Yeah. And then you know that if you get it dead in the middle, it's going to nice and smooth. It's yeah. going to go in. You're going to have no problems. It's that feeling, isn't it? <laughs> That's right. Yeah, but, yeah, you know, it gets a bit complicated when you've got three injections and three in the other arm. Yeah. Then you have to actually target it so that you're actually still in that <coughs> muscle region. And you actually got to picture that triangle in that. Yeah. And then yeah. know the actual edges in that triangle that yeah. you need to actually target. So but, but, uh, this is experience because you know exactly where, where those points are. But the other, other people would have to feel around that muscle. Yeah. Okay, so they can actually see the whole thing Yeah. before they can actually... <coughs> you can see... Um, Quite yeah. Fine there. Yeah. yeah. Um, so it, it, you know, I think the people uh, they'll, they'll struggle with skinnier people. Yeah. Because it, that, that it, to actually define the muscle for the rest of their bone and skin, it's much harder. What about um, people who it's not quite well defined? I, I had the lady whose arm was kind of her body was almost like triangular. Yeah. And it was kind of really really strange. I mean, the rule of kind of putting your hand on top and finding that part, I think, is yeah. quite useful. Yeah. Then people say two fingers down, but people have different size fingers. Yeah. Two fingers down. If you've got a young child, yeah, you're actually right towards yeah. the, the, you know. So, so you, you just have to feel that area first, yeah, and then then actually just feel that little muscle area, because yeah. you know we, we I don't know if everyone does pediatrics, but when we do pediatrics, you know the kids have got a very small area that you actually can actually target, yeah, and it's definitely not two fingers down. No, definitely not. But so when the patient comes in, how do you get them to like sit down? I tend to get them just to sit straight and then have their arms like this. I prefer to get them. You get arms there, yeah. yeah. Because if I have to change sides, it's much quicker. I'm not searching for my sharp spots it's and there. stuff like that. Yeah. So yeah, I just do them. Uh, if, they're, if, I, if they're doing this one, just sit here. Yeah. And look, look towards that way. Yeah. Okay, and then quickly prepare. Yeah. And it goes and say, okay, done this. We'll look this way. Yeah. No, the, the other thing is if they feel faint, okay, yeah, they like you can just say, just lie down, yeah. put your feet up. Yeah. Much quicker to do that than they faint here and then they're trying to go, catch sort of thing, you know. Uh, <laughs> I've seen some consultation which are just tiny. Which is just like, yeah. It's really nice to have a bed. Yeah. It's really nice to have a bed. Yeah. Some pharmacies that I've seen don't have beds. Yeah. And so the worry I have is if you inject, 
Yeah. And then if they were to faint, are they yeah. going to hit their head on a wall or like something that's yeah. hanging? Or... Yeah, the, the other option is sometimes when I actually have uh, people are really got phobias itself. I actually don't use that chair, I actually use this here. Yeah. Yeah. So the chair's here, Yeah. Okay, and they're sitting here, so you can tell them to turn around there yeah. or that way. If it's kids and parents as well, okay, so the, the, the parent can sit there. Yeah. Kids sitting here, chatting away, playing with the games. Yeah. Okay. Flu. Have you ever used the? the I hate the flu needles. But you, but do you ever use the smaller ones? You know the N zero or the micro um, needle. It depends on what I get in stock. Okay. You say. So I haven't used the N zero ones. Okay. And actually, all of them are blunt for me because they they they're using the orange needles. Yeah. That they they're using. The needles three, attached to the yeah, barrel. They're, they're right? attached to the barrel. They're three quarters of an inch. Yeah. The gauge is quite thick. Yeah. You know, it's not a very fine, thin gauge. Is. Yeah. Anyway, well, you know, I, I get annoyed because when I do uh, travel vaccines, no one actually complains because they they they, they, they just smoothly goes and goes. When did you do it? Done it. You do flu, everyone goes, ouch! You know, that sort of thing. But it's scary like, when you're putting it in. And yeah. It's kind of the skin kind of goes inwards yeah and the amount of force you're putting on yeah. it it's just it feels yeah. a bit uncomfortable kind of initially yeah but do you maybe people have like different thickness of skins or yeah. something well, they, they, they do, they do but like, even if you spread it out just to actually make sure that you've got a, 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 a thinnest layer of the actual subcutaneous layer as possible and you're going yeah. to try and spread it. it it's just that the needles are too blunt yeah you know and it does you do you've got to put a bit of force in it's yeah. not just a gentle squeeze in and squeeze out. Do you hear that, manufacturers? <laughs> Get that sorted. Yeah. The only one I think is, is the Pfizer one. Yeah. That actually has a detachable needle. Um, but is it more expensive? No, it's the same price, is it? Well, uh, it, it depends even. on how much you actually get. It's expensive because what you're looking at is the discounts we get. Yeah. Because we got, I end up always buying Immuvac. Yeah. Because the Immuvac, you can get them for about 252. All right. Whereas all the others are actually in the three pound mark, so yeah. that's fifty pence extra for each, yeah. each vaccine. You see, yeah. which when you've got numbers, can add up. <laughs> yeah, no, definitely. Every every penny counts for that. Yeah. Um, so from my, do you, do you get like ten people in in one go, or do you have one after the other, or is one it after, no, one after the other? Yeah. Yeah. Because you know you just need one anxious pers person there amongst that lot, and then yeah. that tends to cause uh, anxiety in others. It's and hard families, you know, they they like to can't come in groups. So they're, okay. they're sitting down, you know, go through. The, yeah, it saves you explaining everything three times. So you have to go through the whole consultation process three times. Yeah, and then you tell them to go out. And when you come to the final clinical bits, where you don't want everyone to hear that they've got diabetes yeah. or anything else. Okay, so that's the only time I say, you know, if you stop out, I'll call you back in one at a time, and we'll do the injection one at a time, sort of thing. Uh, but you know, uh, when I when you do the risk assessment, so when you actually look at the countries, what they're going to be doing, do it all together in one go. Yeah, so it yeah. saves you. Uh, Plexus. <laughs> right. So the differential it, feature was it all got big here. It didn't got big. I shed a rash. Yeah. Okay. She didn't go actually big at all. I was just observing. But you know that there's a first rash that started here. Okay. And then there's a rash there, bang, and have the adrenaline went in. <laughs> okay. I said, right. Well, uh, keeping an eye on you. I said to get guys. Get me an ambulance now. Yeah. Okay, so 999, yeah. ambulance ready. Although she didn't totally collapse and so forth, I just didn't want to take that risk for it, that yeah. person to actually totally yeah. go down and you're start, starting to see it. I see any signs of anaphylaxis, ambulance has to be here That's straight away. First thing, isn't it? It's kind of a lot of people jump to, oh, I've got to get adrenaline. Yeah. But you should, because you can't handle the entire process, you need to have an ambulance there and then have them come in. Yeah, yeah. that's yeah. pretty cool. So, I've uh, done the first thing, you got a slight improvement, but it wasn't going down, so a second uh, adrenaline went in, and by the time that second one went in, the ambulance was here, so they took her away and then... Uh, ah, yeah. you're a lifesaver. A reaction, even if it's a faint, needs to go to a yellow uh, card, you yeah. need to report that. Yeah. Because the more reports they have, they can actually identify how many people actually get reactions to a vaccine and so forth. That's crucial. Yeah. The only things I hate about these things is the amount of paperwork involved yeah. with it. <laughs> You've got the yellow card. NHS England want to know about it because that has to go down as an incident report. Yeah. If you especially say a flu one, because I had a flu one as well. The yeah. flu one was a real weird one. Really? Okay. For, uh, what, for NHS England? NHS England. Yeah. Okay, and, and the amount of paperwork, and then they, they turn around and so they say, you know, what would you have done to avoid this? I said, 
Nothing. <laughs> so I can't avoid him in that place. It's from occurring. He, he has no medical history, which would indicate that that's yeah. a thing. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's a thing. Medicines, one in a million, something odd, idiosyncratic occurs. You can't predict it. Yeah. You know. But you did it. The, the thing is, is I think more importantly would be how did you react to it and how you reacted to it is call the ambulance and then everything yeah. was fine. Yeah. Yeah. Then it's... yeah. You know, the one I had is they had the, the, the flu jab. So uh, I said, okay, uh, he's had the flu jab. Then he goes, he's got a funny taste in his mouth. And I said, okay. Uh, then the, he, that taste, taste disappeared. Mm. Had it for a few seconds. And I thought, okay, the tongue's going to swell up and so forth. They had nothing at all. They had this funny taste. And I said, okay, you're sitting out for 15 minutes. You want to actually keep an eye on you. So you want him to go outside. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So I was doing my dispensing and so on. Yeah. And then I said, he came back and started talking about feeling okay. So just sit down, don't do anything. If anything happens, I'll come to you. So they just relax. But he was talking okay. So I thought he was talking okay. Nothing's swelling up and so forth. So he goes at home. Yeah. 12 o'clock at night. He has a full blown anaphylaxis. Wow, so it's delayed by what, five hours? Yeah. So he said that he started, you know, swelling lips, shortness of breath. So he got, goes to home, he goes to any, they keep him in for a while, and, and they actually sent him home saying that he's actually fully recovered. So they didn't give anything else, they just observed him and sent him home. Following that, five o'clock, he has another full flow blown anaphylaxis. What? Okay, and this time he had to be admitted to hospital. Did he get discharged with an EpiPen or sorry? Yeah, he's now, he way. carries an EpiPen with him. Okay, okay. Yeah. they can go. But, you know, you can't predict that they're going to have the anaphylaxis later yeah. uh, or not going to have an anaphylaxis later on. Yeah. So they need to be able to contact, first of all, the GP, not even us, because that's wasting their time. Yeah. In, even the, rather than GP, if they think it's something serious, go yeah. to any. The advice should be. A and E or call an ambulance in here. If them some, if you feel that even if, you know it's just a, a slight reaction to something, because yeah. you do not want that to actually get into a full blown one. Yeah. So I think this this is a lesson for everyone to learn that you know do not expect a typical pattern yeah. in, in in anaphylaxis. Well, I think the data says that there's no there's nothing saying that it will happen within five minutes or 10 minutes or 15 minutes. It can yeah. be completely random. Yeah. So getting them to wait, I tend to get them to wait for a couple of minutes yeah. just to make sure that their arm is fine and the pain. It's not really to do with anaphylaxis so much, yeah. but I keep them under observation. So. And that's it. Thank you so much for your attention. A big thank you goes out to Jukanesh Patel from Row Farm and Avicenna for helping make this uh, VR experience possible. And if you're inside of the HubNet already, you can go through the different videos which will teach you a bit more about the various diseases. Um, if you don't have a HubNet account, please give us a call or go to hubnet.io.